It's my great honour to pass the chair over to Dr. Ian Martin, former Special Rep Representative of the UN Secretary General. Thanks very much. Um, do we have uh, Ambassador Eliasson online, I hope? Um, I am. My... Excellent, excellent. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you. Do you hear me? Good. Yeah, yeah, you're coming through. Good. I just want to say, yes, this is of a, a former United Nations staff member, um, but also as a UK citizen, someone who would like to see my government uh, cooperate more fully, um, as well as other governments. Um, but it's a privilege and a, and a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Ambassador Eliasson. I, I can't do justice in introducing him without eating too much into our time to uh, go through his career. But uh, as you will know, he's been Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, as well as its permanent representative of the UN and ambassador to Washington. Uh, he's been a, a mediator from Iran, Iraq, through Nagorno-Karabakh to Darfur. He played a key role in the United Nations General Assembly in the creation of uh, what was then the Department of Humanitarian Affairs, today OCHA, uh, and was the first Under Secretary General and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Uh, and then later he was President of the General Assembly uh, and, of course, Deputy Secretary General from 2012 to 2016. I myself was in New York for much of that time and know a bit about internal discussions that went in on, in, on inside the Secretariat in various matters. And I know that uh, Deputy Secretary General Larson was always on the side of uh, the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, in those conversations. And he's famous uh, in New York and elsewhere for always having his copy of the United Nations Charter with him. Uh, he's written a memoir, um, alas, not, I hope, only not yet available in English. Uh, the English title is Words in Action, A Life in the Service of Diplomacy. Uh, and it includes a chapter on Dag Hammarskjöld, both what he meant to um, a young Ian Eliasson and, and also uh, how Ambassador Eliasson followed the investigations of his death. So, it's great that we have him here this morning. Um, over to you, uh, Ambassador Larson. Uh, thank you very much, Ian, and uh, thank you, uh, all of you who have already contributed so uh, fruitfully to this important discussion. Uh, I will share with you some personal and professional observations on Dr. Hammarskjöld. His uh, life and death have uh, followed me actually all through my life, both personally and professionally. Uh, as a teenager back in the 50s, uh, I prided myself together with all Swedes of him becoming Secretary General. And uh, he was followed very closely, of course, by all of us on all levels and all ages. I spent a year in the United States, an exchange student, and very uh, much recall how there were always references to leave it to dog when there was a problematic situation in world affairs. I was a Swedish Navy cadet uh, being on an exercise in the Baltic Sea uh, on the uh, 17th and 18th of September 1961. Uh, in, in the morning on the uh, radio, uh, we got the news about the death of uh, Hammarskjöld in Andola, in, at that time, Northern Rhodesia. Uh, already uh, during my years in the United States, I had had ideas about joining uh, international diplomacy, both for Sweden and the UN. And I can tell you that that morning, uh, that was the day of my decision to go for an international career. Uh, so uh, he has in very much, uh, my, uh, to a great degree, influenced my life. Um, <clears throat> when I then later joined the Foreign Service, I remember the talks in the corridor when the reports were out uh, in 61 and 62 from the uh, Northern Rhodesian investigation and the UN investigation. And um, I, of course, as a very junior diplomat, had no voice in those discussions. But I recall vividly how um, the Swedish experts from uh, the 
Swedish criminal police and the uh, uh, transportation authorities were talking uh, negatively about the uh, investigation in Northern Rhodesia. Uh, I have a, an impression that they talked about casual procedures and hasty procedures. And uh, above all, as I remember, uh, a disregard of African witnesses uh, and uh, that eyewitnesses even were not uh, recorded. So the uh, remaining impression uh, from the reports, and unfortunately not substantially changed by the UN uh, investigation uh, successively, uh, is that uh, the uh, reason for the, uh, the uh, crash was pilot error. Um, it wasn't really spoken out that clearly, but uh, the general impression lived with that, with that view. There is a letter from Roy Wilensky, the Prime Minister of uh, the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, back to the government in London, talking very clearly about this evidently being a, a, a human factor accident and pilot error uh, cause of the crash. So over the years I followed this, I had always this issue in my mind. And uh, I, I have a couple of snapshots that I want to share with you. Uh, I remember uh, meeting with Knut Hammarskjöld, who was the nephew of Dag Hammarskjöld uh, in the 80s. Uh, and uh, he asked to see me privately in the office. I had then been, become a mid-career <laughs> diplomat. <laughs> And he wanted me to uh, run with the baton, as he said, and do something about this uh, investigation and go deeper into the causes. He was not at all happy with the Swedish government's uh, attitude, as Henning Melber has, has described to us recently today. Um, he was uh, frustrated and disappointed uh, about his uncle's fate not being uh, sufficiently and carefully uh, analyzed and and researched. Uh, another impression that I have, which was very strong, was the meeting the, the families of the uh, Swedish pilot and the Swedish navigator and some of the others. There were eight Swedes and seven others, which represented the uh, UN staff mostly, and security, the security detail, of course. But re I remember vividly uh, the uh, despair and sadness of the family. You know, these, uh, these, uh, this crew had been particularly picked and chosen uh, because of their skills and trustworthiness. And for the families to live with the impression in the world and in Sweden that it was their relatives' uh, errors and human factor mistakes that was the cause of the crash was a heavy burden. For them, and I remember promising them, them that I would do what I can at a moment that hopefully would be given to me later. By the way, I had a similar uh, impression from another important conversation, namely with Hendrik Wischkopf, whose name was mentioned earlier today, uh, whose father was killed in the crash. And uh, I remember how strongly he made the case for me. At the time, this was, of course, the time when I was Deputy Secretary General. But I wanted to to share with you the feeling of uh, emptiness and despair and frustration that existed among the families for so many years, apart from the Hammarskjöld family. Now, I was then given the opportunity. I was given the opportunity when uh, Sir Stephen Sedley's uh, commission, the Independent Hammarskjöld Commission, uh, left its report uh, and came to New York. Uh, it was uh, uh, Lord Lee, Lee who, who came, and also a friend of mine who is in the meeting today, I see uh, Hans Corell was a member of that commission. And I received that officially as Deputy Secretary General. Uh, and uh, I took this extremely seriously. I glanced at it uh, first night I had it in my hand. And the following morning, I went to the Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, and I said to him, uh, here is probably the most serious report we have. It is based on uh, Susan Williams' extremely important book, Who Killed Hammarskjöld, 
which I had read, of course, in earlier, 2011, when it came out. And I said to uh, uh, the Secretary General that this is an opportunity to use the 1962 resolution uh, that we have, that if there is new evidence, it should be uh, presented back to the General Assembly. And he uh, quietly agreed, uh, realizing, of course, that this was politically extremely sensitive. But um, uh, we both agreed that we had to make a very careful analysis of this uh, commission's report. And I said uh, to uh, Lee and to Sedley that we will carefully study this and we will come back to you with a uh, conclusion that this should be brought to the attention of the General Assembly. The legal department did an extremely good job. Uh, I'm glad Stephen Mathias is in the room. He was part of that team and I believe together with three or four extremely careful experts and they came to me approximately I would say six to eight weeks later, having studied this very, very carefully. And uh, they concluded that there was evident, there was enough new evidence as it seemed, or indications that this had to be taken seriously by the Secretariat and the UN, and also to the, uh, given to the attention of the uh, General Assembly. Um, we, um, uh, named rather soon this uh, independent panel of experts and identified very quickly uh, the ex extremely experienced and much respected Judge Mohammed Chande Otman, uh, who took on the chair of that independent panel. Uh, and um, we were reinforced by their report to continue the work. So was the General Assembly. Uh, and um, he was then named, as you know, and I don't need to repeat that, uh, eminent person, and his mandate was extended twice. And uh, there were particular uh, advice that I gave him when he took on the job, namely to make sure that he visited Andola and tried to see, uh, as long as they are alive, the uh, eyewitnesses uh, of the accident, of the uh, crash. And he did so. And by the way, that's what I recall from the OLA colleagues that reported to me, uh, two women, uh, uh, young officials, asked me to stay on. And they asked to stay on only to say that they were so extremely upset about the exclusion of African witnesses. Uh, that was an emotional moment to them to uh, say this to me, I remember. I won't go into details into the further uh, process. Uh, I, I just want to uh, give you the the reasons for Judge Otman to uh, be critical of the shortcomings of the reports of 61 and 62. In his uh, two, uh, two, uh, 2019 report, he gives those, uh, th those shortcomings, uh, when he names those shortcomings. One, the local testimonies were not taken seriously enough. Two, the assessment of possible hypotheses was incomplete, especially the one related to an attack or external threat as a reason for the crash. Thirdly, there was insufficient account of the fact that an armed conflict involving the UN was taking place in the area in September 61. At the time, military operations were carried out on both sides of the border between Congo and Northern Rhodesia. Fourthly, it was obvious that British and, Nor and Northern Rhodesian representatives were trying to influence the investigation work in the direction of pilot errors as a reason for the crash, rather than any external influence. And he uh, concludes that report by saying that due to the information available, it seems plausible that an attack or outside threat may have caused the crash through a direct attack that caused uh, the plane to crash or by causing a temporary distraction of the pilots. This was later reinforced, as you know, uh, in, the 19, in the 2022 report, which is quoted in fact in the rubric of the president's um, So the facts are that there were two planes in the air and uh, fire or smoke was seen in the, in the air. Yeah. 
there is radio traffic, uh, which is of extreme importance, from uh, which came out 1992, the uh, Sutol and Oleg information that came out at the time. Uh, and of course, the deeper uh, political background, which uh, uh, was obvious in the presentation by Dr. O'Malley recently, uh, the fact that you had an, a secession of Katanga uh, from uh, Congo, uh, the fact that there was strong economic interest uh, involved the Union Minière was mentioned, and uh, the influence that they had on on not only the running of Katanga, but also on recruitment of mercenaries who played an extremely important role. There was even, as you know, fighting going on between the uh, these mercenaries and UN Irish troops. Uh, and uh, you should also know that Dog Hamasel, when he went to uh, Congo at the time, his mandate from the Security Council was, to say the least, lacking. There was uh, limited enthusiasm, and he definitely didn't have the full support of the Security Council going to Congo. But he was driven by the extremely important issue of not seeing countries in Africa div be, di be divided up according to ethnic or religious uh, lines, with sometimes often very clear economic reasons. So this was the background. And this is also, of course, where the speculations go in the direction they go uh, of the answer to the question of who was behind this. I don't think anyone has yet come to a serious conclusion on this, but we are approaching. And we are approaching, and I, I have noticed the uh, growing impatience, uh, the unmistakable uh, irritation uh, with Judge Osman of not seeing archives being opened. He has identified three countries, uh, US, UN, US, UK, and South Africa, obviously. Uh, but I believe also after this discussion you have had here today, uh, there is reason to even have a second look or a third look at other archives. Uh, first of all, different archives inside nations, which go beyond the uh, classical archives of the foreign ministries, but also the intelligence community and the military archives. That's where we probably have more information. And uh, there's also uh, the possibility where we still have people alive who were present uh, professionally to speak to those who are involved in, in, in other countries that beyond the three mentioned. Uh, Belgium is one country, but also several others I will mention in this discussion today. Uh, I'm sure the search will be broad um, and at the same at the same time more precise, since I know that Judge Otman has worked so carefully that he knows pretty well what he wants to have, and he has indications that he probably could pursue. So I think we have to uh, increase the pressure and uh, the interest of the outside world to uh, open up these archives, knowing also that we have such a tremendous support in the General Assembly, the latest figure being over 140, uh, and growingly with every report, more and more supporters of the resolutions. And I'm glad my countrymen were active in that diplomatic work uh, during these past few years. And when I was Deputy Secretary, I noticed the commitment of my, my colleagues in being making that support as broad as possible. I'm also very grateful to Zambia, uh, which has was committed to uh, bring in the African countries and others uh, as co-sponsors of the resolution. And also, interestingly enough, the countries who have contributed to Secretary General was another informal group that brought this number to such an impressive number. So with this support and this background, we should give Judge Otman and the UN Secretary General, whose intention was so clearly stated in his comments uh, last year uh, at the ceremony in honor of Hammarskjöld and sacrifices made by our UN personnel, uh, and make sure that we this meeting with its uh, eminent uh, participation, I, I would want to say, uh, would bring the extra weight to this pressure. Not only is it a matter of honoring and showing the gratitude we all should show to a person <laughs> who's chosen to lead our world organization uh, based on the UN Charter, 
which should be very close to our heart. And uh, I'm glad Ian mentioned it. I have it here in front of me. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, that we we have an obligation to uh, to not uh, accept receiving only half truth or whatever percentage you choose to 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 decide upon. We haven't reached the full truth. The file is incomplete. And the search must go on. And to me now, this has reached another dimension. The reason why I feel even more strongly about never giving up on getting the full truth is that we live in a world today where the word, and that's why I put that title on my book, Word and Action, the word and the truth and the fact are, we is not taken for granted. When I grew up, when I suppose most of you grew up, truth was something absolute and facts were facts. We didn't know what alternative facts are. And we couldn't conceive of a democratic debate where truth and lies can be completely mixed and where you can even win elections on lies. And this is being strengthened by the power of uh, social media and the tone and the uh, confrontation and the polarization that goes on. So I would put this in this larger context of respect for the truth. And then since we have such tremendous strong reason to push push this issue further and harder on this issue, which said we would have it would have such a great significance to uh, disclose the truth truth. So in closing, I would say that hiding the truth makes the darkness darker. And hiding the truth makes human progress and human dignity smaller. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jan, and uh, thank you for all you've shared, and thank you for being the strongest possible advocate for truth in this and other matters on the 38th floor of the, the United Nations. So we have a little over 15 minutes for questions uh, to uh, Ambassador Larson. Um, already I have one here, please. We've, we've had a number of comments, um, and indeed we've, we've even had a precise reference um, to a file in the National Archives in Pretoria. So um, there's a lot of there's material in the chat which we will be able to pass on to the UN, and which you know hopefully will, will um, inform um, um, the UN's investigation. Uh, the only thing I would ask to our online um, colleagues is they could remember to put things in the chat rather than in um, Zoom's Q and A facility. We're going to be able to export the chat. We may not be able to do the same with the um, Q and A facility. But so, some of the other points um, perhaps later in the day I might be able to bring up. Very good. Please. Yeah, thank you. I'm Joel Lorena, the Wall Street Journal's correspondent at the UN in 2011. The book came out and I covered Ms. Dales in, in many meetings there. I wanted to ask you to elaborate, if you can, what you said about the Security Council not having given a very strong mandate or one at all to Secretary General Hammerskull. I think that's quite interesting. I would imagine that Britain and the US were not amongst those permanent members who gave that uh, a strong endorsement. Is that correct? Please, uh, you, did you hear me now? No? Yeah, yes, please, if you, uh, if you, yeah, did well, you hear the... I didn't hear you, that you're referring to me now. Thank you very much. Well, on the first question, uh, uh, it's interesting uh, to, to have this uh, information possibly from India and Kenya, uh, and I'm sure that uh, that could be passed on. Uh, I'm sure that Judge Opman would be interested in that information, and I'm sure that uh, Stephen Matthias could pass this on. Although I would say to you that uh, there was there is an enormous number of uh, uh, of speculations and ideas and, and information, and Judge Opman has done a very good job also in, shall I say, eliminating a, a huge number of such speculations. 
And looking back at the number of those speculations that I have followed also all through my life, uh, I also asked myself whether they were not even intentionally put on <laughs> out there to confuse and to give the, uh, the even more plausible uh, theories uh, credibility. So um, uh, there's been a tremendous job done by 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 uh, Judge Othman to select the most important information. He has that information in his hand. He has shown it in his work from 2000. 15 onwards uh, until now. And I know that he has very precise questions, precise indications. And if we could only get the confirmation from the archives on those questions, I think we we could uh, reach another level of knowledge of this case. Uh, the uh, Security Council 61 uh, did not give uh, council, uh, give uh, uh, Hammarskjöld a green light. Um, the discussions were very, uh, very, uh, I would say, uh, act. They were, they were very. It was a very harsh atmosphere, uh, and uh, the uh, Congo file had been a one of the most difficult files in the UN from 1960 onwards. Uh, there was no unity on key uh, resolution. And there was definitely no mandate given to the Secretary General to, to do his mediation. Uh, there is a film out now, which may you may have seen. We have seen it in Sweden very early, uh, a, a, a movie on the on Hammarskjöld, where they, uh, they have a generally pretty good ambition of uh, sticking to the facts. But there are some speculative elements and moments uh, but there is also then uh, uh, some parts of that movie that even shows the differences of view, not only inside the Security Council, but also inside the Secretariat. Uh, there were questions raised by by uh, Ralph Bunch, who was the actually the the, the closest advisor to Hammarskjöld to thread carefully. But... Hammarskjöld felt an extreme commitment to uh, to go to Congo. He knew the risks. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book which came out uh, uh, after his death, 1963. And in my book, I quote uh, some of the portions of that book, which almost show, showed a, a premonition, a sense of, of what was coming. He knew that he took an enormous risk going to Congo, not only not having enough of a political mandate, but also the physical risks involved, knowing the political and military situation in the area. So, um, no, it's right. Security Council was not fully behind his efforts. Thank you. Looking for another question. Perhaps I myself could ask whether you have any advice as to how the governments that are failing to cooperate could be most effectively influenced and pursued. Um, uh, obviously, I'm thinking of the, the UK um, uh, and, and the US. Um, would you have any advice from <clears throat> member state dynamics on that issue? Well, I think this meeting, and I, I really commend uh, you and the initiators, uh, uh, University of London and the UN Westminster Association for doing this. Uh, and when I looked around the room and uh, the list of participants, I say that the collective influence of this group, group is impressive. And I hope the records will be also spread and, and uh, that the, the message will be spread. Uh, I think now all focus should be uh, put on the archives issue. Uh, with all the uh, arguments that uh, are given to, to uh, you uh, in the reports, uh, but also by simply realizing what is at stake for the UN, for the uh, memory uh, respect of uh, 
a secretary general and his crew and his uh, associates. And the fact that this in today's world is a message of what we can do uh, in cases where we see often you deep lack of clarity. You can recall deaths of the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Sweden that disappear in the in the uh, uh, jungle of speculations and nothing really comes out in the end. There are so many cases where we need to to clean up and have the uh, truth come out, whether it's painful or not. And uh, you have all the reasons to do that. And um, I think that the words of uh, Otman will probably mirror some of this in his uh, next report. Uh, he may uh, need time. I hope that he will be able to do his final report by July and then the, count, the General Assembly will receive the report in the fall. Uh, and uh, we do, in my view, we do not need that much time if there is an openness to open archives. And that's a big if. But I think this uh, conference uh, could have a very deep influence on how things go. And I think we all should feel a duty uh, to run with the baton uh, and uh, bring in as much weight as possible behind the request for this opening of archives. And thank you, Jan, for your own commitment. Uh, this is, reminds me of some many of the human rights issues that we have worked with together <laughs> that you simply must never give up. Uh, it is, uh, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Uh, we always said that when we were fighting on different human rights fronts, Jan, so I'm very glad that you were chairing this session. Thank you, and I look forward to being able to read your book. Can you tell us when we might have the opportunity to uh, to read an English uh, an English version of your book? The uh, the chapter on Hammarskjöld has had a uh, an informal translation, and uh, Susan Williams has it and uh, has promised to share it with you in case you're interested. Uh, the other part of the book is being discussed with uh, with. Uh, uh, publishers. Uh, I hope it will come around. Uh, I also know that there is a separate book being uh, planned, which comes out in the fall. So I'll keep you posted, Ian. Please do, all of us. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Any one final question before we break for lunch? There's one question on yeah. the um, chat from Martin Plouch, who's a fellow of um, this institute. And he asks, um, do we have any reason to believe that any of the states refusing to release their archives might change their minds. I didn't hear the question. So um, there's a question from uh, Dr. Martin Platt, who's a fellow of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and he asks, do we have any reason to believe that any of the states refusing to release their archives might have changed their minds? <laughs> uh, I think they, they certainly feel the pressure is mounting, but I think they should simply come to the conclusion that that finding the truth, establishing the truth, contributing to truth is more important than continuing to hide and by that uh, make such a huge dent in the uh, basically the meaning and uh, intention of the UN Charter. And uh, if we can see such an enormously important step taken, even at the expense of some painful conclusions, uh, would be, I think, a liberating element in world politics today. But maybe that's wishful thinking. I hope not. I, I think you have a question there. Can you read it from the, the screen? Uh, I, I, I don't get after it, Alison can himself, but if you can read it. So, um... Um, this question is, I'm researching this incident, may I ask a question to Mr. Ellison? I'm still trying to track down what was written on a page of the USAF, United States Air Force, manual in green ink found at the crash site. A copy of that document was sent to Mr. Ellison in 2013. That is mentioned in the letter to the UN. Does he remember precisely what was on it? 
Maybe perhaps a rather difficult question to ask, just following a precise recall of many Everything. <clears throat> Everything I have received was has been handed over to uh, Judge Othman, of course, but I don't recall uh, such a communication. Uh, right now, I find myself on my country home in the Baltic Sea, so <laughs> I have no way of <laughs> documenting my conversations. But I, I don't recall this. Uh, I have the, uh, I have all the reason to give everything I know and have available to uh, those uh, who are. Now having responsibility, I feel very confident with this support from the, such a great majority of the General Assembly and uh, that uh, we see it in the deeper perspective that I've been trying to, to describe. Well, thanks again, Ambassador, for inspiring all of the commitment that's already in this room. And uh, uh, I know that everybody here uh, and many who are online will try to uh, make a reality of the, uh, uh, the, the, the further push that you're in, in encouraging us to, to make. So thank you very much indeed for uh, giving us your time today. Thank you.